PBOR Black Box Online Radio, coming to you from West Virginia at heart and from around the globe. And hello everybody, today is Friday. Welcome to the Cooper Friday segment here on Black Box Online Radio. On Fridays in the foreseeable future, I'm going to be talking about D.B. Cooper, the man responsible for the only unsolved skyjacking in U.S. history. And this is an episode that was requested by multiple listeners, talking about Joe Lackage as a D.B. Cooper suspect. I asked you guys a polling question, which D.B. Cooper suspects would you like to hear about in an independent suspect profile? And at least three people requested Joe Lackage. So if you have any ideas for future episodes of Black Box Online Radio, feel free to drop your ideas in the comments section down below, mostly talking about the Zodiac Killer, Jack the Ripper, and now D.B. Cooper. So... Joe Lackage is a suspect that I actually think is a rather strong one, and that was one of the first comments that came in saying this might actually be D.B. Cooper, and he is the suspect of an individual named Bill Rollins, who has not only written a book but also put out content on YouTube, and he's also authored articles. I read one of his articles in a, a, an online publication called The Mountain Press, and to provide the most basic introduction, D.B. Cooper, as previously stated, was responsible for a skyjacking. He requested $200,000 in ransom money, and then he ordered the plane to take off again, and then he jumped out, parachuted into the night, into cloud cover, into the rain, never to be seen again. This was all in 1971. But I don't want to focus too much on the basic background information. I want to talk about the theories. And I have to begin with something that I heard in Bill Rollins' first video that I just happened to have clicked on, put his uh, material into YouTube, and the first video that I clicked on from him proposed a theory. And no matter who your D.B. Cooper suspect is, even if you don't have a suspect, this is something that is worth considering because it's not only about the suspects. What happened to D.B. Cooper after he jumped out of the plane? Bill Rollins put forward the theory that D.B. Cooper jumped out, parachuted, survived the jump, landed either in the Lewis River or near the Lewis River, and he had a boat stationed nearby. He had a boat placed nearby, and he got into the boat, went on the Lewis River, then onto the Columbia River to a place called Tina Bar, and then he took the money that he was trying to transport, the $200,000, and three bundles of the money fell out and then they were covered with the sediments naturally, and they weren't discovered until years later. And yes, three stacks of bills from the D.B. Cooper heist were found years later at Tina Bar. And when I first heard about that, I thought that these were going to be things that were reasonably well preserved. Okay, maybe they were a little bit soggy or something like that, but in my mind, I was thinking of well-preserved bills. But once I actually saw photos of the bills... They were absolutely degraded and torn up, and as you can tell, I'm somewhat of a newcomer to this, but I wanted to use this as an opportunity to be a fresh set of eyes on the case. So, I mean, no matter what, is that how D.B. Cooper escaped? And there are reasons why Bill Rollins says this. He says that there is diatomaceous evidence that states that D.B. Cooper's money was in the Columbia River, not only the Lewis River. And I love using that word diatomaceous as talking about the diatoms that were found on the bills that came from the Columbia River. So Cooper parachutes, lands either in or on the Lewis River, and then takes a boat to the Columbia River. And this will be very important and relevant to his D.B. Cooper suspect, Joe Lackage. But I had to begin with this because last week on the Friday segment, I was talking to you guys about a theory that was put forward by the Nat Geo program the uh, sky jumper that got away, or something to that effect. And that one proposed a different theory about what happened to D.B. Cooper after the jump. And that was that D.B. Cooper landed in the Lewis River, and by that point he had already gone into shock because of the cold, that more or less he was either paralyzed because of the cold, in shock, maybe experiencing early onset hypothermia, and that he was just kind of maybe, maybe flailing around a little bit in the river for a while, maybe even not, and that he's just in the water, and that his parachute got caught up in the propeller of a boat, and that dragged D.B. Cooper, the parachute, and the money all about, all the way, all the way to Tina Bar, let's just say that, because that was relatively their theory, and that's how the money ended up at Tina Bar. So, 
I think that that would be a very reasonable theory if they found the body, if they found the parachute, but only finding three bundles of bills at Tina Bar, I mean, that was just something that just didn't sit well with me. I don't know if there's enough supporting evidence to go along with the theory that was put forward on that Nat Geo program. And as I said, no matter what, no matter whom your D.B. Cooper suspect is, I think that Bill Rollins put forward a very solid attempt at finding out what happened to D.B. Cooper. And as previously stated, on Fridays I'm going to be talking to you guys about D.B. Cooper. Every Monday I talk about the Zodiac Killer, Zodiac Monday. On Wednesdays, Jack the Ripper, Ripper Wednesday. And now, welcome to Cooper Friday. And there are a lot of things that are out here on Black Box Online Radio. Thousands of true crime episodes, as well as audio books. On the weekends, I release segments of the White Horse Killer Saga, and I'm on the third one right now. White Horse Strong is the name of the book, and that's going to be coming out on the weekends. And if you want to support any of these efforts, you can hit the like button and subscribe. It really helps out the channel. And you can also go through some of the links in the description box. One of them is for buymeacoffee.com. Buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxnid88. That allows you to make a donation or contribution to help support the show, and anybody who makes a donation will get a shout-out on Zodiac Monday. Okay, as I said, Joe Lackage is the suspect of Bill Rollins, and you guys requested it. I'm new to the D.B. Cooper case, so I'm like, all right, let's see, who's Joe Lackage? And I found out that Bill Rollins had this very well-done YouTube video, which was about 12 minutes long, talking about his explanations for the D.B. Cooper case and why he thought that Joe Lackage was D.B. Cooper. And I don't think that I have ever been so conflicted when I've been watching a true crime video. It was like one sentence. I was like, wow, what a brilliant point. The next sentence, I was like, oh my gosh, give me a break, dude. No way. I mean, it's just back and forth, up and down, up and down, all around. But in all seriousness, as I said, I do think that Joe Lackage is a re reasonably strong D.B. Cooper suspect. And there is evidence that has been put forward in Bill Rollins' video. And he actually has eight points of evidence that he talks about. This is called D.B. Cooper, The Eight Superlatives of Joe Lackage by Bill Rollins. Number one, the Dan Cooper connection. I mean, I don't want to get into that too much because I've covered that in other episodes D.B. Cooper didn't actually use the name D.B. Cooper. You guys all know that. He used the name Dan Cooper. It was more or less an error that was made by the media. Dan Cooper was the name of a comic book character that was reasonably popular in Europe. It was a French language comic, but it was translated into other languages. It was written in other languages. So, um, I mean, I digress from that. And this is a big one, though, on his list. I mean, the his workplace... Now, D.B. Cooper was on a plane, right? And he left behind a lot of evidence. Cigarette butts, he's touching a glass where he's drinking bourbon from, as well as leaving behind his clip-on tie. I mean, if this thing happened, I mean, in the 90s, this case would have been solved easily. Easily, I think, this case would have been solved. But in the 70s, just evidence was not well preserved. But D.B. Cooper left behind his clip-on tie, which had some very rare metallic particles on it, and it was put under the electron microscope, and it's not simply that it just has rare metals. What Bill Rollins also talks about is that it also has things like titanium that has a blend of stainless steel, and not only the metals themselves, but the combinations of metals, but there are also other metals out there that are somewhat rare, such as palladium that were found on D.B. Cooper's tie, and the whole point is that who on earth would have a tie that is going to have these types of metals on there? And the explanation that has been provided by Bill Rollins is that Joe Lackage worked for a company that dealt with electronic equipment. And, I mean, they more or less manufactured pieces of electronic equipment, converters, and so on. And I don't want to get into the specifics because I don't want to misstate something. But according to Bill Rollins, Joe Lackage would have experienced... All of these, he would have had exposure to all of the metals that were found on D.B. Cooper's tie. Now, I said that every sentence was conflicting, like, okay, this is a good point, that's a bad point. The good point was, he provided a really solid explanation as to how the metallic particles could have been on D.B. Cooper's tie. The problem is, though, the very next sentence was, 
no other suspect has any type of explanation as to how there could have been metallic particles on D.B. Cooper's tie. And I'm just thinking, dude, I'm a newcomer to the D.B. Cooper case. That is just so obviously not true. And the reason why I get a little bit heated about those things is I have followed the Zodiac Killer mystery and the Jack the Ripper case. Those episodes come out on Monday and Wednesday, res Wednesday respectively, here on Black Box Online Radio. And normally, when someone says, my suspect is the only suspect that has this, my suspect is the only suspect that has that, usually that's not true. You just have to search a little bit more. You'll find that other suspects actually do have reasonable explanations to answer question X. I mean, let's look at another D.B. Cooper suspect, Milton Vordahl. If you were to Google Milton Vordahl, you will find lots of things about him being a D.B. Cooper suspect. You will also find things about him having patents working with rare metals. I mean, I think that this video might have been made before Milton Vordahl was widely discussed as a D.B. Cooper suspect. But that's the whole point. There are other suspects out there who have explanations as to how and why these things could have taken place. All right, though. So that is something else that, um, I mean, just the whole video is filled with these things. My suspect is the only suspect that can explain this. My suspect is the only suspect that it can explain that. And I just was not uh, extremely impressed by that. But the workplace thing, though, absolutely, that's a strong point. This ties in to an additional point that is shared by Bill Rollins about Joe Lackage as a D.B. Cooper suspect. Not only would he have an explanation for having rare metals on his tie, but because of his work in the electronics industry, Bill Rollins states that he should have known about a hydroelectric dam that would have been nearby the quote-unquote D.B. Cooper drop zone, and he could have used the hydroelectric dam as a marker or some type of guiding point. It would be like a Christmas tree with a single Christmas light on there. Something about as vivid as that, because more or less the hydroelectric dam would have just been glowing. If somebody's jumping out of a plane into cloud cover at night in the dark, that would have been a way that D.B. Cooper could have quote-unquote guided himself or just having some type of reference point. And again, I think that that's a brilliant observation. But one of the biggest things about the uh, suspect Joe Lackage is, firstly, I mean, let's just give a little bit more background. He had a military background himself. He was a major. But he also had a reason for D.B. Cooper to use a very particular line of dialogue. And that is that D.B. Cooper told someone on the plane that he had a grudge. He didn't say that it was against anyone specific which has led to countless theories existing online, where some people are thinking that he has a grudge against the airline, some people think that he has a grudge against the um, airplane manufacturers, different types of companies, but he just said that he had a grudge. Now, what could the explanation be for Joe Lackage? It could be because that his daughter was murdered in a skyjacking. And to help us out, I'm going to go to an article from the New York Times called Hijacker Kills Wife, Pilot, and Himself. This is from 1971, and this occurred roughly 50 days before the hijacking. I'll get the exact number in a second. It's either 51 or 52 days before the D.B. Cooper skyjacking. And, I mean, a lot of people do not like the New York Times, by the way, but I have found that they have been somewhat reliable when it comes to archiving old articles and converting them into text, and even just keeping the old articles in photographic form. Like when I did the Ripper Wednesday segment, I found one article that was discussing the Jack the Ripper suspect, Carl Feigenbaum, from 1894, and it was preserved online. So... I mean, content aside, I give them credit for that. But let's have a look at this article, Hijacker Kills Wife, Pilot, and Himself. Posing as a doctor with a patient, George M. Giff Jr. dragged his screaming young wife aboard a private plane in Nashville today, forced the pilot to fly here. This is in, for, by here they mean Jacksonville, Florida. Then he killed his wife, the pilot, and himself when cornered by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The police in Nashville said the couple broke up a week ago. They had a 21-month-old daughter. Mr. George Giff was a 300-pound real estate man from Nashville, and he leased the twin-engine aircraft saying that he was a doctor 
and that his wife needed treatment in Miami. When it says least, I think that they mean taken over. As for medical credentials, he prepared to board the plane. Mr. Giff pulled a forty five caliber automatic pistol and ordered the pilot to take off. Also aboard were Mr. Giff's friends, later identified as Bobby Wayne Wallace, and the co-pilot's name was Randall Crump. Once airborne, Mr. Giff ordered the 29-year-old pilot, Brant Q. Downs, to head for the Bahamas, but Mr. Downs apparently convinced Mr. Giff that a refueling stop was required. When the plane landed at Jacksonville International Airport, FBI agents were waiting, and they shot out two tires and an engine. Shots then erupted from inside the cabin. Agents said they rushed to the plane to find Susan Giff, age 25, and Mr. Downs dead from a gunshot. Both died from gunshot wounds. Mr. Giff was fat fatally injured from a shot in the temple, and the agents reported that Mr. Wallace and Mr. Crump were unharmed. Mr. Wallace, age 32, was charged with piracy, that's Bobby Wayne Wallace, and held under a $100,000 bond. He also faced federal charges of kidnapping. Mr. Giff, age 35, was once an instructor of biology at Peabody College in Nashville. It was there that he met his wife, Susan, who held bachelor's degrees and master's degrees in education from the college. Mrs. Susan Giff, who used to be known as Mrs. Susan Lackich, once talked of marrying a rich man who could give her the life of a movie star, that a former classmate said. The couple was married three years ago, but friends said Mrs. Giff spent almost all of her time with her parents and almost as much of her time with her parents as with her husband. Mr. Joseph S. Lackage, her D.B. Cooper suspect mentioned in this episode, Mrs. Giff's mother said Mr. Giff called her last night and said, I'm going out of the country and I'll be out of your hair. I want to meet Susan just long enough to say goodbye and give her back her jewelry. Mrs. Lackage said, that she would meet Mr. Giff along with Susan and the daughter, work as a switchboard operator at a motel, where she worked as a switchboard operator at a motel. I decided not to go, Mrs. Lackage said, because this felt like something was wrong. Susan would want to work it out for herself, though. Instead, she said she put her granddaughter, also named Susan, to bed, and spent the day listening to the radio and waiting for her daughter. Okay, so we have to um, kind of move on from that, but you can get the idea. There was a real skyjacking that took place, and Joe Lackage's daughter was murdered in this event. And another thing that I was reading about in an article that was written by Bill Rollins was, he talks about the motive, the grudge, and it isn't as simple as just he's upset or that he's mad. He gets into something that is what I... I mean, what I guess we can call the psychological autopsy, because when I was listening to the Missing Moore Murray podcast, they had a guest on named Dr. Eckstein who said, with his students, he likes to create psychological autopsies. And the psychological autopsy is when you try to figure out what was somebody thinking before they either died or disappeared, because... D.B. Cooper might not be dead, and um, Moore Murray might not even be dead. So, but if you can still use the same psychological autopsy mechanism, what was D.B. Cooper thinking? And what Bill Rollins attempted to do was to put himself in the mind of somebody like Joe Lackage. His daughter has just been murdered in a skyjacking. So he's thinking, okay, I don't want to kill myself. I don't want to jump off a cliff, but I am so frustrated with life. I've just had such a terrible experience. I want to jump out of a plane. I want to do this ransom stunt and jump out of a plane. And I give credit to Bill Rollins for using that type of thinking. And I shared his take on the subject. And also credit to Dr. Eckstein for sharing that publicly. And even somebody like Dr. Phil, whom most people would think of as a little bit of a clownish figure. But when he had his talk show, he said that the reason why he became a psychologist was when he was a preteen, he began to notice that he didn't only want to know what were he didn't only want to know why were people doing the things that they did he wanted to know what were they thinking when they did it and i would invite any of you guys to try and answer this what was db cooper thinking when he was planning the skyjacking is it something like he experienced a terrible tragedy and this was his way of just sort of saying f you to the world and if he dies, he dies. If he doesn't, then he doesn't care because he's at an extreme low point in his life. Or is it someone who actually wanted the money? And I guess um, when I was first exposed to D.B. Cooper years ago, just learning about D.B. Cooper as some type of 
American figure in history. I was just thinking that, yes, D.B. Cooper wanted the money, and it was an opportunity to commit a crime where he could obtain the ransom money and successfully get away with it because it's a big challenge with these ransom-based operations because or ransom-focused operations, rather. I even remember when I was a kid watching an episode of a TV show where there's this hostage situation. Someone's holding somebody hostage and they ask for a ransom and then they send somebody to collect the ransom money and then that guy's just arrested by the police. It's an enormous challenge for criminals to get away with the ransom money. But D.B. Cooper was successfully able to do that. That's more or less what I thought just as um, the first time I had ever heard of D.B. Cooper. But what do you think? Do you think that somebody like Joe Lackage would have... Um, do you think this explanation is solid? That his daughter was murdered in a skyjacking... Therefore, he wanted to create a retaliation skyjacking only because he was just frustrated with life. It's not about glory or anything. If anything, it would be about misery and coping with the misery. But I would love to uh, know your responses to that in the comment section. And one thing you may have noticed is I also have to confess that Joe Lackage has a very, very strong resemblance to some of the D.B. Cooper composite sketches. And I stated it in a previous episode. I think the composite sketches are reasonably accurate. But this definitely is not convincing enough. These are not strong enough explanations as to completely certify the case and give some type of seal of approval and say, yeah, absolutely, Joe Lackage was D.B. Cooper. You can find other suspects that might have explanations as to how and why the tie um, had the metallic particles, other suspects that are going to resemble the composite sketch, other suspects that might have had a grudge for some reason. How about Kenny Christensen? He worked for Northwest Orient Airlines, and he probably had all types of grudges against the airlines. I mean, if you work for any company, you're going to be pissed off about something. Other suspects are going to have reasons why they would have said that line, I just have a grudge. I mean, I would love to know what you guys think, but I do think that this is a particular suspect that checks a lot of the boxes, and also somebody who definitely comes at this from somewhat of a standpoint where he wouldn't have been afraid to do the jump. He, I mean, this whole kind of, um, not exactly revenge plot, but this type of just reaching a low point in life, so absolutely not caring about the consequences... That I can comprehend. But what do you think about anything that I've stated in this episode? Is there another D.B. Cooper suspect that you would like to hear about on the Friday segment? And also, more importantly, the biggest takeaway that I hope you guys have from this episode is, I'll just put it into a question. What do you think about that theory that D.B. Cooper landed either in the Lewis River or near the Lewis River? He had a boat station there, and he used the boat to go to the Columbia River before he made his exit. I mean, that is all coming from Bill Rollins. I just wanted to be very clear. I think that that is a solid explanation. I'm not saying that it's the truth, because it's an unsolved case. And if we find contradictory evidence to that in the future, then I would definitely be aware of it and acknowledge it. But I do think that that is a pretty good take on the subject. And one more time, you can put your ideas in the comments section down below. Anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. That's very good if you want to send me larger things. You can also get me on Facebook. Black, my personal Facebook is in the description box. And there is always blackboxned88 over on Instagram. Lots of ways to keep in touch. And that's all from me now. Until next time.